Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA Network Plus Certification Training Course, the online training course with Dual Zone Automatic Climate Control. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about network access security. This is Network Plus N10 004 exam, section 6.3, and we need to explain the methods of network access security. This is a pretty broad topic that takes uh, filtering into account both ACL, MAC filtering, and IP filtering. There's lots of different ways to tunnel and encrypt traffic. And we're also going to talk about other ways to do remote access through our network. Let's start with an idea of what we can learn about filtering. Filtering is a way that we can selectively pick traffic out of our network streams and allow it or disallow it from moving through our network. And most filtering in most environments occurs from the outside to the inside and the inside to the outside. But in a few occasions where people have some important servers internally, what they'll do is set up filtering methodologies that will restrict traffic to the important servers on the inside of their network. There are so many different ways to filter out traffic. Some ways are really good. Some ways are not as good. The ways that we're going to talk about in this module is ACL, or what some people call ACL. We have MAC filtering, and we have IP filtering. So some very basic methodologies for filtering traffic as it goes through our network. Let's start with access control lists, or ACLs, or sometimes we'll call these ACLs. ACLs is a generic term that really describes a way to filter based on a policy that we would put in a file system, in network devices, and operating systems. It's a way that you would create a list that then provides access. And that list is going to be dependent on the environment or the platform that it runs upon. For instance, on a file platform, we may have an access control list that says Bob has the ability to read files. That's an access control list right there. Bob's in there. The ability to read in there and what Bob can read are those files. Fred can access the network. That's something we might see in a network device. Our access control list allows Fred to access the network and do the things that he needs to do. A very specific firewall type access control list might say that James can access network 192.168.1.0 with a subnet mask of 24 bits and only use ports 8443 and 8088. So you can see some of these access control lists can be very, very detailed and really can specify to a very specific degree what one person could do from one part of the network to another part of the network. So these access control lists can be very useful depending on the platform that they're on. And you'll see them pop up all the time in firewalls. You'll see them in routers. You'll see them in switches and other network devices as well. MAC filtering is a much simpler way to provide access to the network. And it's based on the MAC address that is on your network card. Every device on the network has a MAC address. The Ethernet MAC addresses are six bytes long. And if you are a physical device, whether you're a printer or a computer or any other type of device, you have to have a MAC address. It is the fundamental communication that is used in Ethernet networks. On my system, I can look at my MAC addresses if I do and IP config or if config, depending on what operating system you're on. And I did a slash all on my IP config on my Windows system, and it gives us our physical address right here, which is 002170 6 fox 2 Now that address itself can be set up so that only allow that MAC address to communicate through the network, and now I'm filtered out. If anybody else came along with a different MAC address, they would need a different filter. We'd have to create a filter just for that MAC address. It is really designed not for a very, very large implementation of filtering. Can you imagine trying to collect a 1,000 MAC addresses and put them into a table and allow access to the network based on that MAC address? But if it is a very limited number of people that need to get through, it's easier to deny everyone except certain MAC addresses to traverse the network. A much more common way of filtering is with the IP address. I can allow or restrict access to the network based on your network address or your TCP IP address. You can do this IP filtering based on IP4 addresses, IP6 addresses. And if I look at IP address filtering, there's so many different ways to do this on so many different pieces of equipment. This is just one example of how you might set up an access list that will 
permit TCP from any host using uh, going to this IP address, for instance, 169.254.92.103. And as long as that is equal to using NNTP, you can use that particular, you can, uh, you can use that network to go to that IP address. For FTP clients, you can permit uh, to go to this IP address if, if your port number is greater than 1023. So this is just a very simple command line way of filtering, but it's doing it based on these IP addresses. And in this case, it's an IP address range, everybody on a particular subnet. So just by specifying a range of IPs or an individual IP, you can allow or disallow people to move through the network, usually put it on a firewall, put it on a router, and now you've got a way to filter based on IP address. Tunneling and encrypting traffic these days is very commonplace, very easy to do, and there are a number of standards set up that allow us to do this. Uh, as you recall, in a previous module, we talked about VPNs, virtual private networks, where I could be at a remote location on my laptop, but still have access to everything in my corporate network as if I was connected internally. And when it does that through the use of a VPN concentrator, we set up an encrypted tunnel. This is a private link between my laptop and this VPN concentrator. And we're the only two devices in the world that can understand what is encrypted between ourselves. Once we arrive on the concentrator, the concentrator decrypts the traffic and then sends it on into the internal network as if I was just locally connected. It doesn't have to encrypt internally. It's my internal network. I trust everything on the inside of my network. But from between my network and the outside, if somebody was in that coffee shop and they were listening in on what I was doing on my wireless card, they would just get a bunch of gobbledygook inside of frames. They had, would be have no way to understand what's inside of there and what I'm sending back and forth because I have created a tunnel and then encrypted all of the traffic that I sent over that tunnel. One method of tunneling all of this information and sending it through is with a protocol called PPTP, the Point-to-Point -point Tunneling Protocol. It's been around for quite some time. It is a protocol that defines the tunnel. This in itself does not do any specific encryption inside of there. Normally, we'll create a tunnel using PPTP, and then all the traffic that we send through that tunnel will usually be authenticated and encrypted in different ways. There's two ways to authenticate using PPTP primarily. There's one called a Microsoft CHAP v2, a Microsoft Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. There's a newer kind of protocol called an EAP-TLS, which is Extensible Authentication Protocol, which uses transport layer security to work. And TLS, as you recall, very common protocol to use for authentication. And once you get that point where you've created a tunnel, you have authenticated across the tunnel, now you can start encrypting data. And anybody who's doing PPTP these days generally encrypts, this is usually a Microsoft tunnel, encrypts using something called Microsoft Point-to-Point -point Encryption, or MPEE. So this, this process of going from one side of the network to the other, authenticating yourself across the tunnel, and then ultimately going through that process and encrypting, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. But setting it up in your operating system is very easy. You essentially tell it, I want to talk to that device. I want to use PPTP. And it figures out all the other things. I just have to make sure I give it a proper username and the proper password. And everything else happens all behind the scenes. This has been around for quite some time. There is a PPTP client, for instance, in Windows 95 OSR2 and from every Windows version since then. So uh, a very commonplace protocol. We still use it today because it is so commonplace, but it's certainly not one of the newest types of tunneling or encryption technologies out there. Another common tunneling technology is one called L2TP, Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol. And L2TP is a little bit more extensible because it happens at Layer 2. This is also a protocol that does not by itself encrypt. The L2TP is simply a tunneling protocol. And what we did was add on to some of the capabilities of PPTP. And it uses, as you see, UDP port 1701. Inside of L2TP, we will normally encrypt the data using something very standardized called IPsec. We'll talk about IPsec more in just a moment. But IPsec is a very, very common, very open, and very normal way these days. We see it almost everywhere to encrypt from point A to point B. 
Well, if you have a service provider that is providing you with an encrypted tunnel, some people don't have their own encrypted links. They're using a different encrypted tunnel that they are purchasing, they're using as a service. Generally, it's L2TP that's providing that service. And that's because it's so common to get an L2TP front end. In fact, this is just from an iPhone. That's pretty recent uh, technology where there is built into the VPN configuration of the iPhone, PPTP, which we just talked about, and L2TP. So you've got a couple of different options. Notice you, you can extend L2TP to have different capabilities as well. For instance, an RSA Secure ID capability so that you can add on a different token generator along with it. So very extensible, and these days it is the modern version of PPTP. We mentioned in that last slide about IPsec. IPsec stands for Internet Protocol Security. This is another common way to encrypt a lot of data and send it off to another location through an encrypted tunnel. IPsec not only authenticates the communication between devices, it also encrypts it, and it uses these very open standards. It's something that was not written for Microsoft or for another operating system. This was written so that many, many different devices could use it. So you'll see IPsec in clients, between clients and, and VPN concentrators. You'll see it when firewalls talk to each other. You'll see it already integrated within IPv6, for instance, is IPsec. It's extremely common. Now, it uses something called the Internet Key Exchange to be able to do this association between devices. So you'll see the IKE pop up very often when you are configuring IPsec. You have to have this key exchange that takes place. There's also within IPsec something called an authentication header. So not only are we making sure that we have an encrypted tunnel, we can also ensure that the traffic we're receiving really came from the person who sent it. Nobody can sit in the middle of our conversation and be a man in the middle set up where they're receiving information and passing it along, but still get to see everything going on in the middle. Doesn't happen with IPsec. There's also the way that you actually encrypt the data called ESP, or Encapsulating Security Payload. Fortunately, even though there's so many different terms and so many things associated with IPsec, many of these terms make sense. The key exchange is the way that the two devices set up their keys and talk to each other. The authentication header being the way that you would actually authenticate that the data came from where you were expecting. And the encapsulating security payload is the way that we encrypt. We encapsulate the data as it's encrypted up and send it on its way. So IPsec, as you can see here, not a simple protocol. There are a lot of moving parts with IPsec. In fact, if you've ever configured two ends of an IPsec tunnel, you know there are a lot of options available. So the idea is that you have just have to make sure they match up on both sides. There's not a lot of automation here. But as long as you've got all the standards in the same format on both sides of the configuration, IPsec really does work marvelously. And it is one of the, the latest, the most modern encryption technologies that we have out there. If you're looking for a simpler way to do tunneling, SSL VPN may be the solution. If IPsec was a little intimidating for you, think about SSL Secure Sockets Layer VPN. SSL sounds familiar. Well, of course, that's the protocol that our HTTPS uses to create that encrypted link between your browser and a web server. So why not use that same encryption methodology, the same encryption type, to be able to transfer encrypted data from one end to the other? Well, this isn't a web browser. This is a VPN tunnel. This is an encrypted link. But the protocol is almost exactly the same. So it's a very common protocol. And if you're communicating between firewalls, you'll notice some of those other encrypted tunnel technologies we were talking about use some very different port numbers, something you may not be accustomed to seeing. SSL, however, uses TCP port 443, which is exactly what your browser uses, which is probably what your firewall will expect you to be able to use if you are using a browser. So that makes it very easy to flow from one end to the other. SSL VPN is also very simple. We essentially have an SSL configuration in our browsers. So the clients for an SSL VPN tend to be relatively light in the way that they operate, very easy to install, very quick and very easy. SSL also can very much authenticate users, which is an extremely important part. Uh, it doesn't use digital signatures or shared passwords like IPsec does. Instead, just like our browsers are set up, there is a key exchange that happens between the two, and off it goes to the races. So very simple for us to use. We essentially say, 
start an SSL VPN session, and it figures out everything to do in the middle. We can usually run this from even a browser and do a VPN connection to web services inside of our network or load up an extremely light VPN client that can then use things other than browser services. You use standard applications over your SSL VPN, extremely easy to do and using a technology that almost everybody is already familiar with. The VPN solutions we just talked about use encryption. They create these private tunnels that nobody else can see. But what if you just want to connect to another device and you're already on a private network? Well, that would be something like remote access. And a very common, very, uh, very old style remote access is called RAS, Remote Access Service. RAS really is more of a combination of software and perhaps even hardware, although there are some RAS solutions that are completely software based. This allows us to access a device or access an entire network from a remote location. And this was originally designed to be able to use from a Microsoft operating system using a modem and be able to gain access inside of somebody else's network through that connection. So there, there really was no e internet to speak of. We had to find some way and we just dialed up using modems through these RAS servers, we called them. So this remote access service used to be something very Microsoft centric, but these days it's more of just a generic term to describe accessing services remotely. So if somebody says, I need to set up a RAS server, you might want to ask, do you mean the Microsoft version or do you mean the generic remote access capabilities type version and then go from there? One remote access protocol that's been around for a long time is one called PPP, point-to-point -point protocol. And as its name implies, it is a way to communicate from one point to another over a link. This is a protocol that runs at layer two. So we would use this a lot over wide area network links, serial links, and it's extremely flexible. You can authenticate over it, you can do compression, you can do multiple links with PPP so that you can put up multiple connections at one time. Really allows you to do a lot. You can tell it's very mature as a protocol, being able to do remote access through this protocol. We, You can see it used in telephone lines, mobile telephones will use them, serial connections over a wide area network uses PPP, many different ways to take advantage of the point-to-point -point protocol. These days you see it a lot on DSL lines that are running PPP over Ethernet. So you have an Ethernet connection, but you still need a way to authenticate. You still need a way to compress through that Ethernet, perhaps from one site to another, to a service provider. And point-to-point -point over Ethernet is a really good way to do that. What if you're on the network and what you'd really like to do is just to be able to see what's happening on another system? One very common way to do that in Microsoft environments is called Remote Desktop. And it uses a protocol called the RDP, the Remote Desktop Protocol. And that Remote Desktop Protocol allows us to essentially share a desktop one from one location. You can sit at your desk and then see what's happening on any servers that you might have in your environment. You don't have to get up and walk into another room. You don't have to fly across the country. You can sit in one place and look at multiple machines simultaneously using this TCP port 3389. There are remote desktop services on many Windows systems, either a individual system looking and sharing a desktop, or it could be multiple multiple machines out there that are accessing a central terminal server and many people are accessing the network remotely through a single server, which is a pretty nice way to scale this up so that it's much larger. And you can connect just to that one desktop or connect to maybe just an application that you would run from that remote server. So it allows you an extra uh, level of security, it allows you some extra flexibility to be able to do that. And there are clients for Windows, for Mac OS, for Linux, for Unix, for my iPhone, I can run remote desktop protocol on almost any operating system, which means I'm able to do a whole lot of capabilities all from sitting at my desk. Well, if you don't want to be locked into the Windows way of doing things, you could always use something called the independent computing architecture. And although it says independent, this is really a proprietary protocol that comes from a company called Citrix Systems. And if you've ever used something like GoToMeeting or go to my PC, this uses this type of protocol to be able to do it. Yeah, I can run Windows systems, Unix systems remotely. I can pop up a screen and see what's happening on a computer. Multiple people can go to a centralized server to run applications remotely. All of those capabilities are very similar to the remote desktop protocol that we were looking at. It's just that the Citrix configuration is done a little bit differently. The idea is that I would have uh, also, a similar scenario where I've got clients for many different operating systems 
all accessing centralized servers or individual servers and be able to see exactly what's happening and have everything run on those remote devices. Very ingenious and allows you to scale some of these services up to be very large by just having a very big server and having practically zero client on the other side. Imagine running full-blown enterprise applications all from something like an iPhone. It becomes very easy using that remote, de remote desktop protocol and the independent computing architecture protocols. The remote desktop protocol and ICA protocols are proprietary or built on operating systems, but there are some open source ways that you could share desktops. A very common way is using the virtual network computing set of protocols and applications, or VNC. And if you're looking for something that's open source, that's a very good solution. Very common to see that so that you can load a VNC client on Windows machines and Mac OS devices and talk to servers that are running on Windows or Mac OS completely independent from the platform that they might be running on. It uses something called RFB or Remote Frame Buffer, which is really sending down exactly what it sees on the screen. So a very effective protocol if you're looking to exactly duplicate what you're seeing on the screen, but it's, it allows you to work with some very graphical environments. This uses TCP port 5900 through TCP port 5903. There's some other TCP ports that handle doing this through a web browser. So that even, uh, even allows you to go to any machine without any special client, open up a web browser, and remotely connect to what's happening on another machine. Very ingenious, and it works quite nicely. Let's review some of the things that we've learned now about these network access security devices. What kind of filter can restrict traffic at the data link control layer? Do you recall what kind of filter that was? Well, if it's at the data link control layer, it must be a Mac layer filter. Our next question, what is one of the most common encryption technologies in use over virtual tunnels? A very common encryption technology. Well, there's certainly one primary one in, in the world these days, and that's IPsec. And our last question, what Microsoft protocol is used for desktop sharing? Among other things, it would be the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP. Well, that summarizes what we need to know about network access security, our filtering, our tunneling and encryption, and finally, our remote access. If you'd like to see any more of our Network Plus videos, participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.